You are listening to the North American Kings podcast, your traditional masculinity training ground. I'm your host, Glenn Kowalski, founder of North American Kings LLC, a leadership development company based in Cincinnati, Ohio. As we all know, the man brand has taken an absolute beating over the past few decades, and it's our mission to change that. We're going to do that by helping you join the fight to reclaim traditional masculine values. Welcome to headquarters. Training starts now. Welcome back to the training ground, ladies and gentlemen. I am your host, Glenn Kowalski. Let's get started. We've got a very fun show for you today, but first, I have to tell you something funny. It started with Gillette, and now it's Harry's. What is the deal with big razor companies alienating their customer base? And I mean on a personal level. You know who just wants you to have a good shave? Naked armor, razors, and wet shave gear. These guys supply everything you need in order to have a great shave every time. From amazing, balanced straight razors to the manliest smelling and most soothing aftershave that you can get, this company is here to do business with you. And did you know that a portion of all Naked Armor sales go to the Kurt Tiffany Food Foundation or to the Food Fund, which is providing meals to feed hungry Americans? I didn't until I was a customer. As of this recording, just under 23,000 meals have been provided with help of customers just like you. Now, right now, my customers can get 15% off anything in their online store by going to NakedArmorRazors.com and entering coupon code KINGS15. Don't wait to start enjoying the highest quality shave you'll ever give yourself. That's NakedArmorRazors.com. Now, in this leg of our show, we've been piecing together the definition of manhood. Now, I'll be honest with you. Putting together this show isn't difficult, but it does take some thought. I mention this because sometimes, and I mean sometimes, like with my children, I'm articulating points out loud for the very first time. Uh, some things are inherent, and it takes a little extra squeeze in order to get the good stuff flowing, right? But sometimes it's a matter of what to talk about given the plethora of choices that are immediately relevant and available. And I've got to say, they're making it easy this week. This time, CNN comes to the rescue and hands us something too personal to ignore. I'm not usually a CNN fan, but sometimes they can be useful. The debate topic that I've been battling since my middle school years Facial hair. This show is going to be about beards. And I am so excited. Do you guys ever get this? Like where you have a passion for something, but it's slightly off the beaten path. I mean, I don't have a thing for beards specifically, but I do like to talk about them. Well, normally we don't get to pursue those things to their fullest extent. I am truly glad that I'm taking on this mission of bringing traditional masculine traits back. Because now I've got a platform, however small, to take the talk about beards seriously, just this once. So thank you, CNN's Kristen Rogers, who in no way is a doctor, for teeing this up. Unfortunately, you're on my, my turf today. So this article, To Shave or Not to Shave, How Beards May Affect COVID-19 Risk. This article link will be the very top of the show description today. Let's start by laying out some ground rules, okay? This is gonna be a, this is gonna be a personal discussion. We're gonna go through some cool stuff. Like don't don't worry, but I do want to lay out some ground rules so people know exactly where we're coming from. COVID nineteen is not a hoax, okay? I'm a conservative, and conservatives like myself across the globe aren't denying COVID's existence or that it's had devastating impacts on people. Okay, some of that impact has been created by policy about decisions we've made. As a country and as uh, and as individuals, some has been, some of some of these decisions. Like some things have been very inconsistent. The presentation of symptoms, duration of the pro, uh, duration of the disease, the lethality of the disease. All those things have been wildly inconsistent. Now, let me be clear. I've known people with like a singular person or multiple of them with every major risk factor that have gotten through COVID, no problem. But I've also met seemingly very healthy people who have contracted it multiple times and continue to tell me it's the absolute worst. And I know people in the audience have, had, have, have potentially lost loved ones, and I truly do feel for you. All right? But my job is to question things I hear 
And we'll go into that in just a second. As I've said on the show, on the very first show, or actually the second show, but we, we always want to question our sources, especially when there are big concerns that aren't being addressed. I mentioned to a coworker of mine who asked me very objectively why I was against stimulus spending, right? The answer was relatively simple. We've shut down economies all over the states and all over the country and all over the world in order to slow the spread and get this virus under control. Now, I mentioned the differences between, let's say, New York and Florida, very similar states in size and population. Now, I think from what I understand, Florida leans heavy on the elderly demographic and New York leans a little bit heavy on the actual population density. Two things that drastically increase the level of risk that these two states would have. And as we saw, at least the time that we were talking, the, the disease numbers, I mean, were almost the same, at least at the time that we were discussing this. Now, our jobs as men is to see what's real, completely divorced of how we feel about it. You know, we're, we're built to do that. We're built to take our emotions and set them aside for a little while. And then the myth is that we, we set our aside, our, aside our emotions completely. And that's, that's a fallacy. And that leads to some problems with toxic masculinity. However, we are programmed to take that emotion aside for a bit and view things objectively. It's how we survived when we were cavemen. That's how we survived today. In manufacturing and continuous improvement, you know, we means test everything we have to do. There's a lot of data being pulled about every, every tiny motion that happens in a, in a manufacturing facility. So if a machine always has a particular problem when we're running a particular product, we have to isolate. We get dig we dig down and we look at root cause rather than the symptom. Now, look, I looked at my coworker and I suggested that we look at the stimulus in the same way. If we were talking about spending trillions of dollars that we don't have to help an economy that we broke on purpose, it would make sense to, to try and see if we broke it for a reason, right? Now, looking at the rate of infection in two states, one that had draconian lockdown measures, and my family lives in New York. I mean, I know how this goes from a personal perspective. And another one that is effectively open, and you've got infection rates are the exact same. We must then ask the question, logically, did the lockdowns work as intended? There's a lot of data to say that they didn't. You know, if not, should we continue with an action? And that's what I call things that we do in reaction to something that we observe in the plant. So do we continue with this action, this, this fix to a problem, if we aren't exactly sure if it will affect anything? Now, I make that point specifically. We don't know if the stimulus will actually fix the problem that we caused, right? But we do know that there were absolute negative impacts to the health and the to the health of actual people in the economy. None of this is an opinion. Like these, these are proven things that we that we worked out as a nation so far. Now it's taking information available and questioning it. That's what we're doing. So logic would dictate that if that if one course of action was having a negative effect that is in shut the country down, we know that that's not having a an, an actual effect. Again, two places that ha that one didn't, one did. We shut down the economies and the numbers are the exact same. So the question is, what are we, how can we really affect the situation? And right now, if we don't know if something's having a positive effect and a negative effect is proven, then it was, it's human nature. It's absolute nature that we would stop and reevaluate and not do that thing. So to my, to my coworker, I said, why don't we just open the economies up writ large and reevaluate rather than spend all this money? But from an objective standpoint, I want you to hold your, hold your ground on these concerns. If you have concerns about policy or if you're at work and you have concerns about a plan that your boss has put together, I'm not advocating for like disobedience or, or whatever, whatever the word you want to use for it. I'm not, I'm not advocating that you actually stop the process and you become insubordinate. What I'm asking you to do is to tactfully ensure that the concerns that you have are addressed. And you can do that in a few different ways. I've always, I've always said, Hey boss, I trust the, I mean, I trust the plan, but 
even even very bluntly, sir, I've got these concerns I think will derail this. Now, a good leader, even if they don't know this or know the specific answer to your question, is going to be able to say, hey, look, let's go over your concerns. You're, you're doing this in good faith, right? I understand like that you see a risk. Let's go over that. This we know is not a problem. Or I don't think this is a problem for these reasons. And you guys can work that out step by step, right? That's what should happen. Now, none of what I'm saying here is to mention that COVID is not real or is not or is any way fake or not to be taken seriously, but I do question what we've done in response. Now, this article goes to show this. Now, it's written well into the Biden administration as vaccines are rolling out. Like this was written like a week ago, not even. Um, and vaccines are rolling out to all corners of the country and to the most affected populace. Yet for some reason, we get served this nothing burger of an article. And it makes a suggestion. Now the article reads, an important part of wearing face masks to reduce the risk of contracting or spreading coronavirus is that the mask fits snugly. Depending on a beard's length and thickness, experts have said it may reduce the effectiveness of mask, of mask wearing by creating more space between your face and the mask. Any opening increasing the, cha uh, the chance that there is a virus that will, will get into the orifices, which can then obviously give you the disease, said Dr. Mona Gohara, an associate clinical professor of dermatology at a at Yale School of Medicine, wearing ma uh, mask wearing doesn't totally prevent infection, but it can help limit the spread of potentially virus laden respiratory droplets among people. Mask use can reduce the number uh, of new coronavirus infections by nearly fifty percent, according to a December twenty twenty study. End quote. Let's review: a beard's length and thickness may reduce. The effectiveness of mask wearing says a professor of dermatology, like skin health, because wearing masks may reduce the spread of potentially virus laden droplets. You guys hear what you guys hear what I'm putting down? Let me ask this question. We're worried that beards will not allow the cloth mask that's used everywhere. I've seen I've seen no of none of those plastic ones. I've seen very little of those plastic face shields. Uh, so the cloth mask, we're asking that we're, we're trying to ensure that cloth masks used everywhere, make an airtight seal around your faces. Got it. As someone who has shaved my precious beard off in order to get SCBA trained for hazardous work environments, that's an actual pressure seal created around your face, like airtight, right? So we're trying to hold a vacuum standard. With cloth, with cloth mask. Now, is that registering? I mean, I, I'm going to catch feedback on this, so I want to be very clear. They're suggesting we hold a standard that's actually impossible to hold. The article continues. For example, a gap of only 0.2 millimeter height can cause 2 to 8% of the inhaled air containing virus transporting droplets to enter the mask unfiltered, said Robin Perrick, or I'm sorry, Robinson Perrick, a postdoctoral researcher at Hamburg University of Technology in Germany via email. The greater the gap, he said, the higher the percentage of inhaled air entering the mask unfiltered. Again, the assumption is made that 100% of the quoted 2 to 8% of unfiltered air will contain COVID droplets. That's obviously not going to be the case. And the line from Emperor Fauci from the beginning when he actually stayed, when he actually started saying he wanted us to wear masks, remember he didn't for a while, was that masks don't keep us from getting COVID. Masks are meant to keep us from spreading it if we have it to others. So how is this meant to help? And I mean with anything. What point are they trying to make? Now, what outcome do they expect? They did this for a reason. And I'm assuming... They didn't throw out this nothing burger article just to get ad sales or just to fill space. It's the internet. They have as much space as they desire. And I don't think that's, that's the case here. I have an idea, and I will get to that in a few minutes. The article goes into some reasons why beards are so precious to some people. For our purposes, they are for men only. 
but we're going to go deeper. We are, we are, uh, there are men who struggle to grow one. In fact, I will say I haven't met a single person who couldn't grow one, a single man who couldn't grow one. Now, I, I, I do know guys that can't grow great facial hair, or when they do, it doesn't look great, okay? But it's possible that, you know, again, if they were let it go for weeks and months, like, they would have something. Now, it's generally their choice to shave that off, and I respect that. And for those guys, if you ever want to make friends with a bearded dude, all you have to do is go up and say, hey, bro, nice beard. I tried. Mine sucked. And whatever, in whatever tone or cadence you want, that's going to get you a laugh. And I don't think I've never met a single dude who didn't be like, okay, that guy's pretty cool. But let's say that you are a male and you can't grow facial hair at all, writ large, none. There are other, and there are many other ways and many, and other, many other things that you make you a man. All right. So I'm not, this article and this discussion is not knocking you guys. Okay. However, a beard is a sign of masculinity. In barring wild hormone imbalances, women don't grow them. Okay? Now, fuzz isn't the same uh, as a beard or a thick mustache, and we all know that. For some people out there, they're going to somehow make that counterargument to me. And those, to those folks, Italian women aren't men. Okay? Fuzz does not count. They take care of that. Okay? Now, people who like, who like to make these arguments are the same people who won't discuss things in good faith. And as we mentioned last week, we don't talk to them, right? You don't engage those people because they're just going to sit there and drive their point into the ground with no hope of compromise. That's not a discussion. That's just you banging your head against the wall, right? Beards are ours. Let's not lose ground of this. And for women who want to grow a beard, they're doing it specifically because it makes them more masculine in the first place. So let's let's drop all pretenses and acknowledge that women think these are naturally masculine as well by nature. All right. I'm super pumped about that. British military officers up until World War I were required to grow facial hair. Now, some facial hairstyles actually signified what level of officer you were. Like I imagine that big general, that big British general just big bushy beard like down right down to like his upper chest right but militaries often use these to seem more fearsome like our ancient viking friends did during the scandinavian expansion and facial hair trends have followed i mentioned in episode one the ability to shave like i mean to like to skin may very well have been a sign of wealth or, pre or prestige that seems to track with trends we found through time. According to Ancestry.com, facial hair gained steam in the 1700s. Now, it was always, again, it might have been a wealth thing before then, but by and large, it seems to have fluctuated. But beards gained in fashion in the 1700s. Now, facial hair takes off, and you get guys like Abraham Lincoln with his oh, beautiful beard. <laughs> but then, but then you, see it, you see a trend where styles change, and you see mustaches more than beards. Now, I don't know if this was there was ever a manlier president than Ted, Teddy Roosevelt, like the Theodore Roosevelt, the Rough Rider, like maybe Eisenhower, but that's tough. But that walrus stash of his was his. I mean, like he owned it forever after. That's the Teddy stash, right? But then you see facial hair flat lines in the age of the, the world wars, both one and two. And that even that it was functional. Like my SCBA training, that was because we were gassing each other. We needed an airtight seal around that. Air from the outside could immediately and painfully kill you. Right? And we're not talking about the same thing with, with COVID. These air filters aren't supplying you a fresh tanked set of set of set of uh like a supply of oxygen. That's not how that works. Air gets in. That's the point. Now, after the Cleveland clean shaven look waned, men went back to facial hair and they went right back to it. Now, I will I will admit, I was never for the pencil stash, right? But that did become a thing in the uh, uh, right after the 40s. And I think the best guy who ever wore that, if you guys want to look this up, was Tim Dalton or Timothy Dalton. And I believe the best movies... I don't want to say the best movies, but the best examples I ever saw with a man there, uh, that pencil stash was either The Rocketeer or Flash Gordon. Both great movies. Tim Dalton, great actor. 
Uh, but he brought that look in, and then it evolved again. We saw the we saw the big '70s stash, and then now we're back in the late '90s and into the 2000s, and beards are making a comeback. Little story from the gym. I was working out here in here in Cincinnati, not six months ago. And I noticed it'd been a little while, like the first couple months of COVID when everything was shut down. Like, of course, we didn't go to the gym, but I've rocked this facial hair forever. And the reason I and the reason I was shocked was I went back to the gym and dudes in their 20s were rocking stashes singularly, like by themselves. And I gotta tell you, as a 30-something dude with kids, I don't know what what made that happen. But I will tell you, I found out. Uh, in the most non-creepy way I could, gentlemen, listen to this. I went up to two uh, younger than me women, you know, would say between their 20s and their not 30s, and and went up and said, ladies, I'm not trying to creep on you. I just, I, I, need, I would like your input. I'm a dad. I've been in hibernation for a few years, and I would like your opinion. And that piqued their interest. They looked over at me, and they said, and I, and I said, what is the deal with all the mustaches? Like, is that coming back? And they both like sighed with relief. Like this guy genuinely doesn't want to hit on us. And they said, well, I think we're, I think all the guys are doing it to be ironic. And I hope that just singular mustaches don't come back just for that. I hope it's intentional. Right. But, but anyway, moving on, men seem to gravitate towards facial hair. And I have to ask the question, why? Looking deeper, I think we can describe some meaning to this. You know, they, they make us look more menacing, which may be the problem with some people. I mean, we're always, men are always going to deal with this look of aggression. Like that's something that we'll have to, we'll have to manage throughout our adult lives. And I will tell you, we will talk about that at, at extreme length when we get into some of the more business, business material, but I will tell you. The beard helps in that manner if that's the intention. Now, they're functional as well. I am I know for certain that leather armor is better than hair, but I will tell you, you can't cut hair with anything, right? It takes a concerted effort. And, and I can also tell you, as a guy who's done this, I've, I've lit a charcoal grill with a little bit more aggression than I should have. And I can tell you firsthand that hair on your face burns before your skin does. All right? The significance of facial hair goes back to the dawn of man. We know this because cutting tools weren't invented for the purposes of cutting hair. Some of the earliest cutting implements date back as far as 800,000 years ago. But that was just a cursory, uh, a cursory look into, into some history. To cut hair, early humans used to actually pull their hair down with two shells, like to get to get to get that nice grip on there. And then they cut with an early age bronze bronze tool. The first razors weren't invented until at least 3000 BC. And that's, uh, and we've got history in the early Viking ages that show the importance of beards. But then you get the Bible. And in Leviticus, you know, like the really boring part of the Bible where God lays out all of his rules. Well, they're, they're, the reason God was giving his worshipers these rules were because he was sending his flock into and amongst the pagans, not, not to do war with them, just living around them, and he needed to set them apart. As part of the rules, ye shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. That's a direct quote. This, this was because, this was the tradition that made them distinctive from their neighbors and set them apart as God's people. And we can see this later in the Bible, but there are also some contradictory points, like I mentioned earlier, about beard maintenance and its significance to what it meant to Christians. And we'll touch on this later in the episode today. The, in the book of Samuel, you, you can see an example of what happens when you lose a fight way back in the day. Now, in ancient biblical times, when you lost a battle, things got crazy for the losers. I won't get into the gory details, like this is meant to be a family-friendly show, but suffice it to say, shaving your beard shaved off was not at the top of the bad things list if you were part of the losing army and you got captured. But in the book of Samuel, we see something else. King David, as in like the star of David, 
sent several servants and messengers to meet this new king whose father had just died. Now, this prince become that, that became a king got a little bit paranoid, right? And he thinks that David is sending his envoy to spy on him and see and look for weaknesses. He doesn't want to be taken over. So dude captures the envoy, shaves their faces by force, and then he sends them packing, right? And upon hearing this, David like rushed in, like one of those scenes where he busts into the you know, into the royal room, and he sees his guys just on his knee, uh, on their knees, just like begging for forgiveness that they failed in their mission or whatever it was, right? But he took a look at his men and he sent them off uh, after seeing them. He sends them to Jericho to grow their beards back in dignity. He says, Don't come back until you've regrown your, your hair or your beards. It was shame, pure and simple. They took their beards. To lose the right to have one was effectively saying you weren't man enough to keep it. Another example, back to the book of Leviticus. During the fall of Jerusalem, the prophet Ezekiel is, is speaking. Now, he is the prophet. Ezekiel's the prophet of God. He's the megaphone for God. So when this dude tells you to do anything, you do it, right? That's God telling you. So the Jews upset God because they were not following his laws and teachings. For example, like would be don't murder, right? Turns out the non-God worshipers that were invading Jerusalem were doing better at not murdering than they were, right? So God punishes them. Ezekiel commands the men take up their swords mid-battle and shave off their and shave off their hair. And it was the first sign of shame amongst the many that would befall the, the Jews for their disobedience. Now, this is heavy, but remember, this was being seen as a punishment. Now, these punishments also exist in modern times as well. Back to Cleveland. Okay? Actually, it's more like Youngstown, but the point stands. Uh, when I was just getting out of college, I, was, I took a sales job in Cleveland. It's actually where I met the amazing Mrs. Kowalski. Um, but anyway, uh, Amish Bishop Sam Millay convinced his followers that members of the Amish community in that area needed to be punished for their lack of faith and obedience. Mr. Malay took 15 members of his church and they raided the homes of some of their church followers at night, broke into their homes, restrained the men, and forcibly shaved their face with, faces with horse shears and electric clippers and filmed it. Now, to the Amish, I'm not, a, I'm not a biblical expert, but I do know that the Amish, like, you're not allowed to grow a beard until you're married. So to be married and have yours shaved off as an extra insult to injury. So I know that this was, this is also very significant for them, in particular amongst other Christian groups. Um, there were five raids conducted, so they did this multiple times the exact same way. This made national news because for the first time, Federal prosecutors actually went at this as a hate crime. And now I don't necessarily agree with the premise of hate crimes just in general as a matter of law, like intent versus motive. Like if you have it, you have it, right? Like this adds unnecessary subjectivity to the process and it doesn't usually help make things clearer in law, which is, which is kind of a problem. In this case, it forced a heavier punishment for the criminals than they otherwise would have gotten. Sam got 10 years, and he's actually, as of like a couple weeks ago, now heading back home due to COVID, COVID concerns. So this happened as a matter of punishment. And you guys can actually watch this happen in real time. Not this specific example, but I've got a great, I've got a great example of this in modern pop culture. I mentioned in our last episode that men and fathers get you know, demeaned men get demeaned on, uh, in Hollywood. And this is just another example. If you guys want to watch this, the link will be in the show description. Uh, watch Brooklyn nine, nine on its own. It's a very fantastic show. Uh, but season two, episode 18, it's a cold open where Boyle, the over eager best friend of Jake Peralta played by Andy Samberg shows off his new goatee. And after some back and forth, three manlier men, restrain him and shave his goatee off by force whilst 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 he screams 
in the middle of a police station. It was absolutely disgusting. Now, my wife laughed at this. She, she thought it was funny because she's never going to understand what they just did. I'm not saying it was rape, but it was going down a very bad path. All right. Now, I want to ask any man out, like any man out there, if another guy grabbed you and forcibly removed against your will a masculine trait from your person and you could not stop it, how would you feel? Again, it's not about the beard. It's about the force. You were not allowed to have this and you're not manly enough to keep it. It's emasculating to all and it's devastating to some. Now, in these cases, you know, we're talking about punishment and autonomy, like at their very core. Let's distill this down. Now, you guys are kind of noticing the direction this is going. I started with a very trivial thing, right? I started with an article about wearing face masks and, 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 and beards. But those little things in culture and in this show do have more significant meaning if we dig deeper. So that's that's why I'm taking you on this trip. Speaking to some people around the choice to abandon facial hair for causes like the military, you volunteer that. You know, you give up some autonomy. One man who I respect a great deal had this take. I see a man with a beard. That man has one because he can't. Like he wanted it. He got it. Right? The military uses, uh, uses it as a bonding tool. You know, in that, like, you require to relinquish your autonomy in order to assimilate into the greater, greater populace. And in some cases, that's good. When done by choice, I'm all for it. You know, God did the same thing. Do this, you look like one of us. It's almost like a uniform. You know, men who do have beards, they do have one because they can. Jack Dorsey, CEO of Twitter. Have you guys ever seen that guy? He has a gnarly beard. And he's the CEO because he can. I don't know another CEO with that level of clout that's got this Merlin's beard, but he does. You know, he's the Twitter CEO. He must be doing something right. And he's showing it. He's like, what are you gonna, what are you gonna say to me? I'm Jack Dorsey. You know, he might not have that much bravado, but again, you guys see the point. I've even made this choice myself. Now, Kelly and I were living in Louisville, and I'll be honest with you, the transition from our home in Wisconsin. At the time of our lives, just again, it, it was not the smoothest transition that I was imagining. And, you know, we were just married. We just had a house. We're, we're struggling, right? And men, you guys are going to have to make similar choices if you get into marriage. And, you know, one thing there's, you know, and Christians really speak to it this way. You've got you, your wife, and then your marriage, and those three things need to be taken care of and nurtured independently. So I mentioned you, wife, and your marriage as a separate thing, right? And the reason I the reason I make such a strong point is my wife and I we had an honest conversation, you know, and it it, it wasn't a, it wasn't a too you know it wasn't too dark a path, but you know the divorce was never on the table. But we had an honest discussion, and at one point I looked at her and said, "Honey, do you do you want me to get us out of here?" And she thought for a second, very solemn. She, you know, she nodded. She said, we we need to do something. I said, "So uh, we're going to put my career on hold. I will get us out of here. I will. And do you want me to do that? Put my career on hold. If we can't last a little bit longer, what well, what do you what do we what do you do you really want to do this?" And she nodded. So. I made a I made one phone call to a gentleman that I'd spoken to during the uh, their the last uh, last job uh, job hop I had made, and you know I had dueling offers and I chose to go to this one company over another, and I made this call to the other HR rep, this HR recruiter generalist, I forget what his position was. He's a great guy. I will forever thank him for this conversation, and he picked up. I emailed him, and then he was like, "Hey, I got time right now. Do you want to talk?" So via email for like 10 minutes. And then we had an hour and a half long discussion at like eight o'clock at night. And it was effectively the phone, the phone interview. He asked me, Hey, what's going on? You know, we have positions open, huh? We have a position home, uh, open in your hometown. Do you want to go there? And within a week I had, 
I had a phone interview or actually I, I didn't have a phone. I actually flew out and, and went back. And during the interview process, I'll never forget. I'm in my suit. I'm nervous. We're talking. And this HR uh, generalist looks at me and almost joking. She, she leaned in and she said, you know, you're going to have to shave that. Right. And I'm like, shave what? And she's like, your beard. I'm like, whoa, whoa, you must be joking. And no, she wasn't. She's like, absolutely not. Like we have a, we have a, a no facial hair policy. And I thought about it for a second. I'm like, oh no, I really want this job. It's the perfect setup. It's great. It's like an actual, there's an actual benefit to me taking this objective of all the stuff, you know, that made me look in the first place. I'm like, oh no. So I crushed it, killed the interview. I absolutely crushed it. I went back to the hotel room and after seeing some friends, cause I was in my hometown, I called my wife to let her know how things went. I'm like, honey, I gotta tell you, they want me to shave my beard off. And there was this moment of silence because my wife likes my beard. I look better and I'm, uh, I look better with my beard on. <laughs> and, and I said, honey, we're, I get, they, they, they're going to have me shave my beard off. If I get this, I, I think I killed it. I think I got it. What do you think? She's like, we got to make this move. So like a champ, I went home and immediately shaved my beard off, like to the skin, everything. And God rewarded me. I got a call, not like normally when you quit a job, you give your two weeks notice. And then if you're relocating, there's usually some time afterwards where you're like handling affairs. So I had like a week of time between like get the house ready to sell all this other stuff going on. And then I'm out, like I'm, I'm working in, in Wisconsin alone. I left my wife to sell the house and I got a call in the middle of that work week from that same HR lady. And she said, Glenn, I just wanted to tell you, you can grow your hair back. <laughs> I was so absolutely thrilled by that. Like take my bonus, take all this other stuff. I get my facial hair back, but I made that choice willingly. So getting back to the CNN article, for those who see the world through the lenses that I do, it's hard to see the real point of this article. There's not a reasonable expectation that we get a vacuum seal around your face, right? Like we can agree on that. You know, the 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 point about articles getting around your mat your particle particles getting around your mask is trivial at best. You know, you can get infected from pathogens flying into your eyeballs. Right, but the experts aren't talking about that. Fauci hinted at goggles, and people lost their minds. Right, like these things are are touchy. Right, so let me be clear: there's nothing wrong with you guys choosing to shave your beards if if that's your I mean that's your choice, right? But if you're in a position where you're providing, protecting, teaching, and disciplining others, it's not a moral issue, right? We have to balance those things. This brings us to something that I'll discuss in later episodes, self-determination, using reason to think for ourselves and strive towards self-government. I'm the owner, the personal, the person principally responsible for my own destiny. If that's the case, men, you know, you have to weigh everything. Do I go to work even though there's a risk that I get COVID in order to feed my children or myself? Or can I work from home? If you can, great. You know, if I do have to go to work, does the benefit outweigh the risk that I bring home COVID and fail to protect my family? So I'm providing or, or protecting. Which one's more important? Which one's the bigger risk? What am I teaching my children about human nature when I make these decisions? Right? They're, they're observing everything. And believe me, they do. You know, wash your hands and don't cough on people. Just so we all remember, that was the deal pre-COVID. You know, or you'd find yourself socially disciplined as a matter of principle. Again, somebody coughs in your face. I expect someone says something at the very least, right? Now, wear a mask forever, though? Uh, I don't think so. So personally, we, my family, have been at risk because I have to work on location. Like, it's just a thing. And since, since this whole COVID thing started. Now, I've traveled across the country, too in this time, still no problems, right? Now we hear anecdotal horror stories, but then you kind of look around your own situation. And is it the same? It may be not. In my situation, it absolutely hasn't been. And it's not been that crazy. 
Now we've taken reasonable precautions, right? Because the virus is real. I'm admitting that. Like that's absolutely real. I'm not refuting it. But we still need to live. However, when the little girl in my neighborhood who has been playing with our kids all day says that their cousin's staying with them in town this week who currently has COVID, we're done playing. Done. We're going home, right? Now my, now my kid's crying because he doesn't understand the reason we did a 180, right? He doesn't understand that. And worse yet, turns out they come out and say they were lying. What? So if we, if we, if we, if, if we do get it, so be it, but we've, we've got to live, but we're not going to hang out with people who actively have COVID because that's intentionally putting ourselves and others at risk. Like that's, that's intentional. That's willful. That's, that's the moral, that's the moral line for me. So Again, like coworkers, family, again, they like, uh, I don't need to be putting them in that position. So with COVID, the country threw everything at this because we didn't have any data on any of the strains in humans, right? We were studying the virus, but in humans, it wasn't a thing yet. So as things started to become clear, now we've got evidence from which we need to judge for ourselves, right? Going back to owning a beard, I have autonomy. I made that small, trivial decision for myself to grow one right? To keep one even. More than that, reasonable adults need to be trusted to make decisions for themselves. We weigh, we weigh, weigh risks every day, like driving our car to our job where we're going to be using heavy equipment or driving by other people who aren't paying attention. You know, the list goes on, like that our daily lives could carry risks. It always has, right? I was presented with information from a person I trust saying that the natural antibodies only lasts like three or four months. Now, while there's limited data on that, it's new information, or it was when I was told that that needs to be weighed. And this person has had COVID multiple times, so it stands to reason, well, if they had it once and the antibodies didn't take, it's either they all die out or it's just this person, you know? But it stands to reason, okay, there's more evidence there. Now, that's certainly different from what they're saying the vaccine can provide. It's a lot longer than that. But the question about risk needs to be addressed as a healthy human man in his 30s with no heart or major weight or lung issues, the risk is relatively low based on what I've personally seen like with people close to me. I've made that choice for myself and for my family, and they have an even lower risk profile than I do. Now, I know people who think like me who are at higher risk and they choose rationally for themselves and they choose to not go out and they, they're hunkering down. They can work from home and they are awesome. They felt it's too risky given all the health things that they're going through. That's fine. Okay. This article stinks of something else and it smells like manipulation. All right. And I'm making that assertion again, barring the nothing article just for sales, but no one, but CNN doesn't do that with COVID. We all know that if there's something with COVID on that, they intend for you to read it. All right, it's not just wasted space. Pointing at hard, vague, unverified, or even trivial stats that hard is is enough for me to, to to smell this. I appreciate statistics. I use them every day for my job. I've studied them quite extensively. But any data guy can tell you that stats they are things, right? Like the word tree means tree. It's an actual thing, right? But stats is a language of telling you a story through numbers. Okay. Now let me be very clear about that. So is economics. Okay. These things can be manipulated. Okay. I mentioned earlier in this episode that they say two to 8% of air getting to you is unfiltered. Well, so what? That's maybe a problem if 100% of that air is infectious. This article doesn't make those distinctions, those very key distinctions. And they don't want you to. They don't want you to ask the question. Again, my big, the biggest thing that caught me was why do they quote a doctor of dermatology, a skin doctor, rather than a pathologist or a virologist? It was either lazy reporting or it's about control. Okay. Like why drum up fear like this? You know, fearful people make rash decisions and some look for any hope to quell it. We've all seen like diver training 
where like like Coast Guard guys, what are they trained to do? If somebody panics and they're coming to rescue, like those people might end up fighting the Coast Guard swimmer. What's that person to do? Incapacitate them <laughs> in some, some way in order for them to effectively be rescued. Some people will fight their rescuers in a drowning situation. And I'm not saying that this is quite the same, but it's close. Okay. Now, fearful people rarely ask the right question. They're concerned about their concerns. They're not capable of thinking deeper. My father doesn't wear seatbelts, for example. He thinks he hates the laws that require it. It's his choice. Why are they entering my car? Fine. Fair enough. I happen to like wearing a seatbelt. It makes me feel part of the car, right? So when I'm driving fast, it looks feels like I'm part of the car, right? So I wear it, and given the statistics I've seen about whether or not they help or not, I choose to wear one. We wear masks because we think that it will help. Or back to choices. I, I've told employees since the beginning when people ask me, it's like, this is, this is against my rights. Kind of. I'm not forcing you to wear it. I'm making it a condition of your employment. Okay? So I say that, hey, you have to wear this just like you have to wear a smock, just like you have to wear a hairnet and beer net. This is just another thing you have to wear in order to work here. You can make that choice or not, but you must assimilate. Okay? And people make that choice. I do it every day. But don't think for one second that I'm not fully aware of the choice. Okay? Now, my question is, what's next? I'm not wearing two masks. I can tell you that right now. Good luck. So, no deal with that one. We were all told 15 days to slow, to slow the spread. It's been a year. I haven't stopped working at all since this thing started. I picked a very stable industry. That's a one reason to get into food. Uh, let me tell you that. But, you know, it doesn't mean that your job isn't as important, especially if you think it is. Right? Now, this article, like others, are about control, in my opinion. Okay? Our president said something very telling when he spoke about the 4th of July. It reeks of the exact same thing. Quote, if we all do this, if we all do our part, if we do this together, by July the 4th, there's a good chance that you, your family and friends, will be able to get together in your backyard or in your neighborhood and have a cookout or a barbecue and celebrate Independence Day. Why? Why thank you, Mr. President? I appreciate your permission to see people and do, do what I want with my property with other people who've chosen to spend time with me. How generous of you. Now, he continues, that doesn't mean large events with lots of people together, but it does mean small groups will be able to get together. So to paraphrase, do what I say, and I'll let you have enough independence on Independence Day to have a small get together on your own property, but only if it's a few people. Stated another way, we've get, uh, we've given you've given me so you Glenn have given me your autonomy, and I will let you play with it for a little bit on Independence Day, even the even though vaccines are out there and those who are at high risk are getting them. But I want that autonomy back when I want to play with it again. Right? Now, no one is more responsible for my family than I am. If I determine it's okay, then and there's no dissent from my wife then we do what we want with our property. I don't need your permission, Mr. President. I'm fine without it. Now, especially on Independence Day, try to emasculate the country by asserting control over something you have no authority to and hoping you, we thank you for it and tell you, good job, you're a great guy. I don't think so. You stay in the White House basement because you're at higher risk than I am. Now, emasculation is why I get fired up about this. The president could have said, I won't have it totally fixed by then, right? Like that would have been acceptable, but he went the extra mile to feed us this nothing burger of hope. That's not an improvement on what we're already allowed to do. So I, I don't need to be cool with that, but it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. Another example, private schools, Catholic schools have been open all over the country for months and months, but bureaucrats, time zones away from you, are telling you how, how you have to live your life and they're keeping your kids at home away from school because they have the power to say, to say so? Like the teachers union president like just this week said the CDC guidelines weren't enough for him. 
a teacher versus a doctor. And that we, we'd have to prove that schools could be safe using their, these CDC policies while somehow keeping schools closed in order so we can't prove it. You see the double speak? I mean, it's there. So this article does something more. This article is suggesting that you give up more autonomy, but that you do it to yourself. Like President Biden and his Independence Day BS, it's, it's, it's meant to emasculate you. Back to the Bible, when the enemy captured you and you were being punished, they shaved you. They took away some of your manhood. They're trying to scare you into changing your body and making you take it away yourself. Right? They're making you take that shame with you because you were scared. You know, reacting to fear is a very different thing than mitigating risk. They are inherently different. They want you to react emotionally. They want you so scared that you'll shave off a piece of your masculinity for the greater good. But why would that be worth it? They want you emasculated because emasculating men makes men easier to control. Emasculated men, fearful dudes are easier to control. I'll speak specifically on emasculation in a few episodes because it's extremely important. But but what this will do to the what will this do to the collective male demographic? You know, we're already dealing with the anxiety and pressure to provide in a society that makes it hard to provide. Like we shut down economies and jobs. Like there's anxiety there, right? It's hard to wrap our heads around protecting our families from something that we can hardly see if someone's asymptomatic and presenting and presents either zero symptoms or death. Like that's the spectrum they gave. You'll either not, you'll either get this and never know or you'll get this and die. And like, it's super spreadable. And I don't know about you guys, but the number of asymptomatic people out there is extremely questionable because how would we know if somebody doesn't report a, 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 a thing that, get, that presents zero symptoms unless they happen to be swabbed later, right? Like, again, it's, it sounds like a lot of fear tactics, okay? Because they're not giving us this information. And that's watering down the statistics that are already out there. Okay. The primary cardinal responsibilities, first two, provide and protect are off the table, right? And now they want you to, to throw debuffs at you. In effect, they want to pile on more shame because men re- are already anxious and they're, they are, if they are that scared of things, now this, this article is meant to make them so much more scared that they'll actually prove it. You know, walk around with a sign that you physically gave up away, a sign of your manhood. Weak men are easy to control by persuasion, fear, or force. Okay, I'm sorry to say that. And if you guys feel this way, I'm sorry. And if, But again, if you've, if you've gone to the same place and said, you know what? I think the risk is too high. I would rather shave off my face or shave off my, my beard. Fine. Your facial hair, fine. I'm not knocking you guys. I just don't want, I cannot have people reacting irrationally. They cannot be making this knee jerk reaction to this situation. An enemy is only vanquished when he sees himself thusly. Now I forget who the original quote was from. I know who told it to me, but I do forget who he's, who he was quoting and I couldn't look it up. Well, the Babylonians did it. The Amish were doing it like 10 years ago. If you shave a man's beard by force and he is on his way to seeing himself as vanquished. Convince him to shave it himself and you speed up the process. Okay, they want us compliant for the things that are going to come. And people are starting to get sick of these COVID restrictions, right? Vaccines are out there and people are asking questions. Well, if I have immunity, if I have the vaccination, why do I still have to wear this mask? And you're going to see the people who have emergency powers are going to strain to hold on to those. We're going to start seeing some weird stories They started to see it with the South African variant or all these other things where there's no information at all about whether or not those will actually help with the virus or not. Or or actually there'll be, it does, there's no study out there that says that these strains will actually be ineffective uh, when it comes in contact with the actual vaccine. So another, we're starting to see little stories pop up like that, that make you think, why are they, why are they trying to make me scared? Right? And it's because men as a breed, we are mo- more prone to question and to take risks, right? We were the hunters and gatherers, right? 
we absolutely needed the ability to put that fear aside, to question things rationally, and then take risk and hunt and, and actually physically do these things. If we are willing to accept more risk, then we'll be able to see through the BS faster than our female counterparts. And in, in some cases, okay, like, like sometimes they're smart, they are very much smarter than we are. But I say that if we can put the emotion aside, we can see things clearly. These institutions want us to accept what they dictate. And we are the largest demographic designed not to, right? We're the largest demographic that's like resistant to just accepting things that we're told. Okay. Now I'm not specifically advocating that you have to go grow a beard just to just shake it to these guys. Beards are important. They make us feel the way we should. You know, they give us confidence to men we, we who don't otherwise have it, right? You get a manly beard and, you, you know, it's kind of a shield there. Uh, I think I look better with one. My wife certainly thinks so. And therefore, I feel more confident and stronger when I have it. You know, what I'm asking all of you to do is to take stock of your own situations and make choices that you want to make. If you listen to this fear mongering and you make decisions based on these emotional states that they put you in, you are no longer a free person. We, you've given away your autonomy to an idea. So don't ever, tr and, and, and this is, and this is outside of the make, outside of the make decisions for yourself advice. Don't ever trust someone that would rather ha you have a Hitler stash than a full beard. Okay. They call it a toothbrush mustache, and it's actually in the article. They show you a chart. But we all know that that's the Hitler stash. That's not a good look for you ever, okay? Now, that's advice you can take to the bank, okay? Now, I said in episode one, never accept emasculation, and CNN just handed you your first test. That's our show. I'm Glenn Kowalski. If you liked this episode, please give us a five-star review and follow or subscribe for free on every platform that you can. We're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, Rumble, and wherever else you get your content. Uh, I will help us get the words out. The word out. Thank you very much. Good luck out there.